do it again. Hey everybody, welcome. I'm April Woodard. With the Black Lives Matter movement continuing to surge, many creators are actually using their art to express their outrage, their pain, and their other feelings of fear. Creatives are exposing audiences to never before seen stories that were omitted in our typical grade school history lesson. They're shedding light, a new light on the past that has brought us to this tough reality of chaos, separatism, and divisiveness. Today, we will speak with writers, directors, and filmmakers who are changing the world with their vision. I'd like to welcome all of my creatives, Taliba Newman. Hey, Taliba. Hi. Kenya Hi. Cummings. And Adrian Woodard. Welcome, you guys. Hey. Hi. Hey. I first would like to thank you guys so much for being here to help me uh, and to help me inspire others to find ways to be a part of the movement. My first guest is a director and writer producer, and she's got all kinds of talents and a bunch of awards, Taliba Newman. And she recently dropped Greenwood Avenue, the VR version a scripted five part virtual reality series that follows a 14 year old girl's coming of age story. And it takes place in Black Wall Street during the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Let's take a look. And this all started over a boy and a girl and an elevator. Never was about the elevator. They were shooting at us. The cops were shooting at us. Some things. I just don't understand the day I die. Wow, Taliba, what a powerful series. And, you know, I just wanted to ask you, um, what ideas helped inspire you to create this piece of work? Um, well, the creator is Ayanna Baraka, and she and I had worked together before working on this piece. And so one of um, the reasons why I took the project was because she was at the head of it. Um, but also I, um, Greenwood was something that I had heard about uh, before. And I knew that there wasn't much content, particularly narrative content out about it. Um, so I definitely wanted to be a part of something a part of a movement where other directors were coming together to uh, present this piece of history uh, to the people in a narrative way. And tell me a little bit about why you decided to tell it through the eyes of a 14 year old. So I, it's interesting that you, you asked that question because a lot of my work is through the eyes of children. Mm. Um, and I didn't even know that this was, I mean, I didn't even, realized that, oh, this is yet another one that's through the eyes of children. Um, I was once asked, how is it that you can, um, how is it that you approach art and activism? And I think when um, bringing stories through the eyes of children, through the lenses of children, it's kind of easy to get people uh, to enter at that point. Mm -hmm. um, a, a topic, a subject matter that might be heavy, that might be difficult for many. So to enter through the eyes of innocence uh, that is then corroded by all of the hatred uh, surrounding this family, um, I think was a great way for us to kind of ease the audience into what is ultimately a very tragic uh, uh, incident and um, a, a, a huge stain upon our history. Um, but a, a, a huge theme throughout the piece is kind of the destruction of that innocence and how this, this young girl is immediately called to grow up in that moment and face what is going on in the world around her. 
Mm, very, very powerful message. Okay, I wanna bring on our next guest at this time. Our, she's a part of the HBCU Storytellers and she worked with actor and director Nate Parker through his foundation and a recent graduate of Hampton University. Yes, she was one of my students. She's entering Columbia University in the fall. Taleb, I know you love that because you're a grad. Uh, take a look at the HBCU Storytellers. For the longest time I said that like, I just can't look at it because it reminds me of so much pain and trauma, but I don't need to see a statue every day to remember the pain that we have to go through. The symbols matter. And if we want to send a message in our community, that statue, a 28 foot statue does not need to be in the middle of our downtown park. With this statue, that's why it's always been bigger than just a statue for me. It's been about unmasking this larger illusion of progress and of healing and access that really isn't there. Once you become conscious, you can't go back. Kenya, welcome. Hi. I remember seeing this and when Nate Parker came to the Hampton Roads area, uh, they showed some clips. And so uh, you recently appeared in the Virginian pilot. I was so proud to see you in there talking about that you have been documenting uh, the Confederate monument. So I'm interested in knowing, uh, I believe it was, I know it was this week, it may have been yesterday, that uh, one of the monuments in Richmond was actually brought down of Stonewall Jackson. Uh, what is it like to be documenting these statues that need to be taken down and then finally see it come to fruition? Absolutely. I think this is what progress looks like. I think um, when we originally started shooting and producing the documentary, it was actually about 2018, 2019. And you know how amazing timing works out and just how everything is going in the country now. We have the momentum that is really, you know, seeing it through and we're seeing these statues come down. I think that it is a good step in the right direction because when we talk about racial reconciliation in the country, these statues represent America's, you know, need and want to cling on to, you know, some of the worst parts of our history. And we have to take a look at what we're willing to, you know, what we're willing to deal with and what we're willing to dismiss. And so I think that it's a wonderful step in the right direction to have these monuments go down. And then, you know, perhaps in place of them having monuments of our black heroes going up, you know, whether it's Colin Kaepernick, whether it's Harriet Tubman, you know, I think this is really a great step in the right direction. I want to ask you, too, because I was reading in the article and it was talking a little bit about uh, your experience growing up compared to your HBCU experience. Did you know about all of these monuments and the significance and how systemic racism is uh, as you were growing up in, in your world? Wow, uh, I'm going to be honest, not really. You know, I've been very blessed to live in a you know community uh, that's very safe. Um, it's fairly diverse, but predominantly white still. Uh, I've gone to predominantly Christian schools. Mm -hmm. And so I've had, you know, sort of an insular experience for lack of a better word. So being part of this documentary was really important for me, you know, in a pivotal moment in my identity and just understanding who I am as a young black woman, because we were, you know, going to places in Virginia that where ra racial reconciliation is so, you know, raw and still so real. So it was an opportunity for me to step into a, a different environment and to realize that all these things that I maybe haven't been exposed to are very real and they're not, you know, it's nothing to ignore. It's a very real thing and, and that I have a part in, in making a difference. And Kenya, we already have a question for you from Lori B. It says, what motivates you to create? Wow. What motivates me to create is the idea of leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about how pivotal this docu this docu series is, and just how many different stories I want to tell, and realizing that art is my activism. Mm -hmm. And you know, I talked about the community that I live in. You know, it's one thing to see things on the internet, and then it's another thing to actually go to a protest. It's another thing to be part of a, a docu series that you know really is part of this movement. So, right. what motivates me to create? is really the idea of leaving a legacy that, you know, stories, you know, they stand the test of time. There's a quote that says that writers live twice. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is always a part of my drive in, 
and motivates me to just leave an impact. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, I'm so proud of you. All right. We're going to invite our next guest now. He's someone that I've known for a while. Uh, he definitely is near and dear to my heart. And at 17, he actually won the best director for his short graphic at the Newark Film Festival. His films depict creativity and powerful statements from the younger audience's point of view. So let's take a look at his most recent project called One Knee. I ain't never been free. 20 years of living and I ain't never been free. Just broken and abused and left to be confused as to why they love my culture but they hating on me. So I live on one knee. I live on one knee cause I ain't standing for that. They treat my peace with violence and my skull with a bat. They claim that I'm a thug or I was cooking up crack, but I ain't never did that. The truth is, they just hate me cause I'm black. I just wanna be free. But with this knee in my neck, I just can't breathe. Nah, I can't breathe. I'm trying to speak. I can't breathe. Wow, Adrian, I'm so proud of you. It's um my son, Adrian Woodard, in case you didn't recognize the name. So honey, um, let me just ask you, <laughs> it's weird, it's the first time I've interviewed you. So your opening line is, I'm 20, I've never been free. And a lot of people would ask, well, how do you know you're 20 years old? How do you know, I mean, what have you been through? What strife have you been through as a 20 year old to, to make a statement like that? Well, when I say I'm I'm not free, I'm mostly talking about like the way the limitations on things that I can't do as a black as a black male living in America. And even as a black individual, as black women in America, there are things that um you guys can and can't do. Like I was talking to my grandmother and she was watching it and she was like, She's twenty years living and you've never been free. She said, um, eighty nine years of living and I ain't never been free. Just black mm -hmm. people in America have never been free. So um, basically, so like things that I can't do is like things that I should not say, or it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, smiled upon for me to say in front of a white audience and a white, um, in a white uh, environment that um, it could, uh, it could lead to um, negative, negative outcomes. So like, um, just like racism, racism is one thing that, that could happen. And um police brutality is another thing that could happen. So things like that. Okay. And I just want to know, how do you think your video One Knee is contributing to the conversation about race? How is it to the what? How is it contributing Later? to the conversation on race? Um, well, it touches racism as of um, how they love my culture, but they're hating on me. So it's like, how, um, white people, they love black music, they love black culture. And, um, but it's kind of like they, um, they, um, they don't really appreciate us as mm -hmm. black individuals. And then the uh, Confederate flag, like that's just a racist symbol. Um, Trump was talking about hate symbols. The, the Confederate flag is a hate symbol. It represents separation, it represents slavery, it represents all the things that the South were fighting for at the time, which were not the things that America should have stood for, so. Okay, all right, let's bring in all our guests. And I just wanna ask you guys and whoever wants to pick this up, they can. Um, have you ever dealt with any pushback as you're creating these works um, from audiences or maybe it's you know uh, Caucasian people or maybe it's other people? Talk to me a little bit about some of the pushback you've dealt with. Anybody? <laughs> Are we frozen? <laughs> Anybody deal with um, that? I can start. Okay. Yes. I think uh, when I'm from the South, I'm from Dallas, Texas, mm. and um, we shot Greenwood in Tulsa um, on Greenwood Avenue. Um, oh, wow. And going to Oklahoma, 
and digging up this history that a lot of people in the community, um, white white people in the community, people who have moved there and want this to go away. Um, I think that was particularly challenging, knowing that we were in a space where not everyone may have atoned or know about this history, where uh, some people's ancestors may have contributed to this massacre. Um, facing that uh, was incredibly difficult at the time. I don't even know if we had all of the tools to deal with that, but but there was a lot that we kind of had to get through and um, you know, kind of narrow focus on the fact that we are all filmmakers trying to, you know, make something that is going to have a huge impact on our artistic and um, broader communities. And so it was important to stay focused and not get caught up in, in, in what you know the environment is in the South around these right. types of issues. Um, I, I had a moment where I was trying to prepare the cast for the scene where we're dragging the family out of the house mm. and, um, you know, to tell children, to tell white children that, that they need to say nigger and need to, to mm. say all of these racial slurs and need to bring in um, this hatred and channel this, this, um, it, that was very difficult and they didn't necessarily know how to do it or want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had to keep reminding them that this is for everyone and we are, are a unit right now. So no one is, is any color. We are artists and we need to keep that at the forefront as we do what it is that our ancestors have called us to do in making this. Right. We, we have a question. Did anybody want to tackle that past question or I'll move on? Uh, okay, so somebody, uh, yeah. at, go ahead. Wait, um, so like one thing that people said under under my post was um, that um, Confederate flag was a symbol of pride, and mm -hmm. um, it's not. It's mm -hmm. it's a South Southern pride thing, and I just thought that was really ridiculous. And um, it because it doesn't stand for Southern pride, and everybody knows what it stands for, especially people of color. And I just feel like people need to be more considerate. And um, another thing people were saying is that um, I was trying to separate people with this video, but I was trying to bring people together. I was trying to make people see my perception. I was trying to make people, people, because I, I believe that people who follow me have some sense of caring about me or else they wouldn't would never follow me. So if they, when they see me with me on my neck, they can, um, they can um, have a feeling for that, even if they didn't have a feeling for, for George Floyd. And um, that's that's what I wanted. So I just wanted to bring people together and spread love. Okay. And Kenya, some people were asking a question of you too, that how does being an HBCU grad help to create your work? Wow. You know, that will always be part of my story. I think, you know, a lot of people probably can uh, or have heard of this. Writers are told to write what you know. That'll always be an experience that I draw from. Um, and just hearing, you know, your, you know, responses, both of your responses to the last question, I think that going to an HBCU in a similar way has made me a little bit more emboldened uh, to be unapologetic with storytelling. Um, it was a great experience to go to Hampton and, and to know that for, you know, these next set of years, I would be around Black excellence all the time and that I could collaborate with creatives and that I could you know, walk to places on campus like Emancipation Oak, which is just so rich with history. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that they, you know, going to an HBCU is just going to be part of my creative identity. I do aspire to write on it and to give very real, <laughs> very real and raw, you know, experiences that I have, you know, faced and that maybe others can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it'll just always be part of my identity in the type of stories that I want to tell. All right, good. Uh, Taliba, your auntie is proud of you. And, <laughs> and Adrian, uh, there's a, actually for anybody, there's a question about how can we keep the momentum going? You know, since George Floyd's death, how can creatives, what can they do to push the movement forward? Anybody? Um, I think keep producing content, keep mm -hmm. putting out things that speak on black problems, black issues. Um, yeah, I think that's the most effective way. And if people want to support 
creatives, black creatives, creatives with a voice, creatives who want to tell our side of the story, then they need to put money to support us um, so that we can also um, start to help to change the narrative and, and so that the narrative can be told from the point of view of the people experiencing the oppression and not the oppressors. Very good point, because if there is no artist, if there is no creative who is capturing these moments on film and on video, then we will not have a record of this moment that we have. So we got to support you guys. We got to uh, make sure we give you funding and support and come out and follow you on social and like your stuff and connect you with people who could actually advance uh, so that you can uh, move on and, and get to bigger venues and, and expose the world to your art. Um, this one's for Kenya. Um, the Storytellers uh, is a great program. Uh, the Nate Parker Foundation really has a great program. The Institute is great. Uh, Adrian and you, Kenya, participated in it. So talk to me a little bit about going around the country and what was the most eye-opening experience for you in the different places that you went to to shoot? It was a great experience. Um, I really like to travel. So the fact that we were filming and traveling combined was really, really wonderful. Um, I think one of the places that impacted me the most is that we went to the Jamestown recovery site. Um, and we went to a particular area that's called the Angela site. Um, there's some historical, you know, there's different historians that, you know, have different opinions but most of them agree that, you know, this particular site that we visited was one of the um, landing sites for the, one of the first African, um, one of the first Africans that arrived in America, whose name was Angela. So we were able to pretty much retrace her steps, you know, walking, you know, down, you know, in fields where she may have walked, uh, being able to actually pick up a shovel and dig um, at a site that was, you know, once inhabited by slaves and uh, even talking to archaeologists about different, you know, things that they'd recovered from the site um, and just kind of holding those items in my hand and being able to, you know, dig and just looking around and looking out on the water and imagining her, you know, being one of the only people, basically the only person that looked like her there at the time and how separated from her people she might have felt. And, you know, that was a really moving experience just because, you know, it takes me completely out of a situation I'm used to where, you know, from Hampton, for example, surrounded by Black people to imagining what this one Black woman may have felt like, mm. you know, coming here with no one that looked like her. Yeah. Things she might have been processing. So that was a really... um that was definitely one of the standout experiences uh, for me. Okay, good answer. Um, another question that came from the audience is about whether or not you feel obligated to tell black stories. I mean, are there other stories mm -hmm. that you wanna tell or do you feel like, you know, I have to tell this, I have to pass this message on because if I don't do it, no one else will. Anybody feel like that or not? Mm -hmm. I always start with the human condition mm. um, because that's what we can all relate to. And black people are not a monolith. So no one creator can tell all black people's stories. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to speak to what we know. Uh, we do have to focus on representation and um, what is being put out into the, the atmosphere until you know, until we can tell our stories in abundance, there is that pressure that, that you know, we feel <clears throat> that's like, well, what is my responsibility in all of this? But I, I felt like starting with the human condition is um, most important because we're never going to be able to stop being Black. Right. For sure. <laughs> that's for sure. That's not going to change at all. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. If yeah. I could add to that. Sure. Um, I think we are all finding ourselves in a moment where people are willing to have the conversation. I think in previous years, people haven't been as comfortable to have these open dialogues. It's kind of been, you know, maybe we would have them around Black History Month. They're kind of isolated. And right now we're in a very unique time in history where everyone, for the most part, is at home. Everyone, you know, you can't escape it. 
you know, pretty much. And I think that because, you know, all of us are creatives, you know, that now that we quote unquote have people's attention at this point, I think that the stories that we're telling should be, you know, not necessarily informational, but we should take that opportunity to highlight um, the, you know, black plight in our art. Um, I do want to tell stories, you know, just in general about black people, about people as a whole, to where it becomes, you know, not a story about, you know, a black woman, you know, but a story about a woman who happens to be black, you know, mm-hmm. seeing us go through, I think that we're so used to seeing, you know, an element of struggle, which is very, very true and very real for our experience. But, you know, to Leba's point, we're not a monolith, you know, there's different things that we each experience. And I think I want to see the the fantasy film with a black lead. I want to see the sci-fi film with a black lead. I want to see the historical fiction uh, with a black lead. Um, and I think that, you know, it's apparent that we're able to tell the stories that have gotten us, you know, the attention that we've gotten. But I think that now that we have people's attention, it's time to kind of, you know, really just blossom. And, and I'm just excited to see all the possibilities and all the stories that are going to be told. Let me ask this question. And then Taliba, we have one for you too. So some people are saying, you know, black is the new black. We're popular again. Some would argue that this is a fleeting moment. So would it last? Mm-hmm. Do you think that we're going to see things change at the Oscars? I see some allies who are portraying uh, biracial characters uh, doing voiceovers say, you know what, it would be better for me to step down and actually give this to a biracial voiceover artist. You know, there, there, there are things that are being extended to us that normally are not. Do you think that this is something that's just temporary? Adrian? <laughs> me? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, you. <laughs> I don't know. I was kind of thinking about that one. Um, do I feel like it's temporary? I is mean, it just a phase? Is it, you know, it's a fad? I would like it not to be, but I feel like it's it's going to be, yeah. Yeah. And and what what makes you feel that way? If any of you guys feel that way, is it because we've been here before or is it because you just don't have, have hope in the human condition that people can change? No, I mean, I, I do have hope that they change, but I just feel like, um, I just I don't know, just seeing like things like, I don't know, I feel like it would always be present, but it won't be as prominent as it is now. That's what I feel. What about you, Kenya? You know, I'm optimistic. I think that we're seeing a shift. I think that we're seeing a shift. I think it's human nature for things to kind of erupt and then die back down and then things to erupt and then die back down. But we're at a state in history where we're trying to figure out what normal, quote unquote, looks like again. So if we're in this phase right now of, you know, things being highlighted, um, you know, I've seen a lot on social media. I have seen, you know, a shift in people's thinking or at least people being, you know, wanting to take, you know, take action and wanting to speak up. Um, But I think that we are moving forward only because right now we're, we're dealing with such a specific and unique time where people can actually sit with it where people can, you know, see it on their feed so much and people are willing to have that dialogue. So I'm optimistic, especially because I know that, you know, laws in some cases are changing. We're seeing statues come down. Um, we're seeing people that normally may have never have ever spoken up, speak up. We're seeing companies, you know, put out statements. And some of it, of course, you know, was kind of like, well, this has always mm-hmm. been a thing, but now it's a really a thing. Um, you know, some of that probably is just rooted in, you know, wanting to not, you know, stand out as the only one that didn't speak up. Right. Um, but I think that we're seeing enough of a shift online and then in real life that things can actually get better. But it, it is human nature, I think, for things to kind of blow up and then die back down. But since we don't know what normal looks like anymore, it's kind of hard right. to say. Right. And like. Taliba, I want to get to your question too, because they were waiting. It says, how do you allow the, how do you 
allow the circumstances around us continue to keep you level and positive and be objective in this day and time in face of so much adversity that still exists? That's a big question. Who did that question come from? <laughs> I think it was your auntie. <laughs> um, uh, that's a that's a loaded question. I, I think that it is important because um, speaking from my own personal experience as an artist, as an activist, as someone who really wants to say something um, provocative, something impactful, it's very hard for me to separate the the black experience from my artistry i cannot just you know go to set and then go home and be like well that was a great day on set like yeah. we're going to just forget about all of the things that we just um kind of dropped into regarding american history and how it, and, and 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 black people um so i think it's really important to take rest to take time to um reflect and meditate and be graceful with yourself mm. when navigating these subject matters when navigating these stories because it can it can really just smite out your light if mm. you if you go too deep and stay there and and don't replenish yourself with things that make you laugh with things with love with with your family with um things that keep you level-headed so I, I lean to my family i have two children i lean to my kids i lean to um the hope, there's a lot of hope in the world. There's a lot of hope that our ancestors have brought us and taught us. And I think leaning into that really helps to me to keep perspective. Okay, and I'll throw this out to anybody too. Uh, what do you have to say to other like-minded folks that you know don't necessarily think that the avenue for them may be protesting for whatever reason, but uh, they do have an art and they do create and they do want to share their perspective. What do you say to them? What, how do you suggest something for them to do? Protest through their art. I think mm -hmm. that's the best thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Anybody I have, else? I haven't been able to protest. I'm not gonna go protest with my baby. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and, and I would normally be out there protesting. Um, so I yeah. have been doing my work, um, focusing on my writing, focusing on my craft, focusing on what I can share online, focusing on education. Um, you don't have to necessarily, if you're not able to, you don't necessarily have to be in the streets protesting. There are so many other ways you can protest. Sign some, get some bills signed, right. sign some petitions. Vote. Hello. Vote, absolutely vote. <laughs> we can do a lot. Okay, here's another question from the uh, social. Although not directly related to making art, one of the artists mentioned documenting the taking down of Confederate statues. We would like to know how any of you guys feel about taking down monuments of historical figures who were also, hold on, stop, who were also ooh, slaveholders or who had a racist outlook like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, U.S. Grant, Andrew Jackson, Woodrow Wilson, et cetera. Mm. I think that was for you, Kenya, since you were doing the story on the monuments. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, how do I feel about those um, those monuments coming down? Essentially, yeah. I, well, what would you what do you think about them that were slaveholders or who had a racist mm -hmm. outlook? I think that we have to ask ourselves what parts of history we're willing to celebrate and what parts of our history we're willing to exclude. So, for the person that may not agree that you know playing devil's advocate, I suppose, that may not agree that they should come down because it's an erasure. Um, you know, I don't think that we ever want to forget the atrocities of slavery, but, you know, if, you know, my sentiment is that they should be taken down because, you know, personally, because I feel that, you know, what message are you sending? You know, for example, a Robert E. Lee statue in um, Charlottesville, I believe, is more so emblematic of putting people in their place, so to speak, and yeah. this ideological, you know, this ideological constraint and, you know, the, you know, and oppression that may come from that is, you know, 
it's kind of like we have to understand like what they represent and what it, it means to have those in the community. And for me, you know, someone that may not want to take them down, can we at least have a plaque email saying that this is Robert E. Lee who did X, Y, and Z and give you the full picture? Because to just have them there and to celebrate them and elevate them, you know, literally in most cases with these statues is sending a, a message that what they did should be elevated, what they did should be celebrated. In the fullness of what they did, we know now historically was not positive. So I think that it's worth, you know, I love that the statues conversation is happening because it just reminds us all of, you know, what our intention is behind them. So my personal sentiment is to take them down, but, you know, for, you know, in a different case, we can at least have something there um, on the statue from perhaps a different statue there, you know, around them to kind of explain the full picture so that people understand the full you know, context. Got it. Anybody else want to comment on that before I go to the next question? So um, your allies or your white friends, are you guys, this is a question from the audience. Are you guys talking to them more about race or are you still kind of dodging the conversation? And what are those conversations like? Um, whether you're talking to them on social media or whether you're talking to them, you know, virtually. Um, I'm, I'm talking to them if they want to be spoken to about this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm kind of tired of just talking to the same people about it. So I would like for them to spark some conversation, for them to ask questions, for them to ask questions of themselves. I've had mm -hmm. um, a couple of conversations, but not enough. Yeah. Um, that's kind of heartbreaking, but it really tells like where we are and Adrian, it also speaks to how far we have to go um, as, as far as like this being a phase is concerned, like until we see more people stepping up to the plate and having the uncomfortable conversations, I don't really know how much of this will stick. Yeah, Adrian, what about your uh, conversations? A lot of yours were on social uh, when you posted your video on your IG, right? And what was that like? So you're, you're asking what they were saying? What they were saying and then what the conversation what? was. Do you feel like you made an impression? Do you feel like you were able to change some minds or were you just, you know, talking? Um, actually, I do think I changed the mind. So, you know, I went to basically like um, an all white school. And there was a lot of people with the Confederate flag. Like they didn't think anything of it. And I remember there was this one dude, and he was he wasn't he wasn't racist, but he just like he just didn't understand because it was a generational thing. It was just passed down from his family, and he just thinks, oh, it represents Southern pride, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a he was a cool dude. Um, he was always nice to me, but he always wear that daggone flag on his shirt. So you know, I would I would I would say something. To him, I was like, you know, that that represents like you know slavery and separation and all that. He, and he was like, no, it doesn't represent Southern pride. But um, after I put out the video, actually, he um, he hit me up. He was like, hey man, I just want to let you know I threw out that flag. I didn't realize how much it um it hurt you. I didn't realize how much it meant to you. I didn't realize how much. It, I mean, it's not it meant to you. What what it meant to you? Sorry, what it meant to you and um and how much pain is behind it. So I, I threw it out. Wow. He had a big, like, like the flag that I burned in the video, he yeah. had big like that. So, yeah. Wow. Well, that's so that was just one little simple. step, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe he'll pass that on yeah. to his friends. I don't know. Day. I don't know how. Go ahead. Yeah. And I don't know how many other people were like that because they didn't, like, people that I went to school with, they didn't really comment on it. I know they've seen it, but they didn't really comment on it. So there may be other people that did the same thing. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Sean Chambers has a question. It says, uh, who are some artists that have done a good job of presenting complicated characters who are both good and bad? Is there a way that art, writing, painting, media can help us think in sophisticated ways instead of all good or all bad ways? That's a layered question. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Can, you, can you read it one more time? Okay, one more time. Uh, is there, I guess to the bit end, is there a way for artists 
to help us think in sophisticated ways instead of just creating characters who are all good and all bad. So maybe the characters have layers. So maybe they do so something like stuff that's bad, okay. and but they have a good heart. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what he's saying. Um, in order to do that, the teller needs to be clear about the perspective of the history, what the perspective of the history is that they're telling. What lens are you telling it through? Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely possible. I don't necessarily think that we need to erase all of the, the things that make America, America. Uh, for me, I don't want you to take the N word out of Huck Finn if that was the original intent, mm -hmm. if that was what you said back in that time. I want to know this history, but I also want to be elevated as a contributor to mm -hmm. this history. And I want, like like Kenya said, for you to tell the truth about the people that you are, you th that have these statues, that have all of these, I was just in, in DC and, you know, John Adams and all of the other founding fathers were all over the room that I was sleeping in. I was like, whoa, like this is, right. this, is this, this feels different. Um, there just needs to be context provided and it needs to be honest, truthful context. And so mm -hmm. I think that we can tell stories with good and bad characters. It just depends on who's telling the story. We have to, right. we have to change who's telling the story. I, I want to ask, this is my question, and then we'll get to some of the other ones before we wrap up. But, you know, what have you discovered during this time that you didn't know about? So, for example, the other day I was reading and it was talking about the, the real estate agencies or the national real estate agency is going to change the name of the master bedroom to the main bedroom. And I did not know that the master bedroom came from a slave reference, a slave master bedroom, had no idea and was just like stunned, like, whoa. So I, I shared that. Is there some information that you learned that was just so systemic that, you know, it was just embedded in everyday things? Children's songs? Um, the ice cream. Yeah, the ice cream truck song. I did not know that was a racist song. That was crazy. Yeah. But yeah, that was pretty crazy. Anything, Kenya? Um, my mind is still blown off of the master bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, uh, whoa. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. I don't. I didn't. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> nothing really. Nothing really sticks out. Honestly. Yeah. Um, I, I was saying, Adrian, it's the master bedroom. It's called the main, now they're calling it the main bedroom because it was the slave masters. But the other thing too, like I went to UVA mm -hmm. and apparently the this shield had some little grooves on the handles of the, the swords and the handles represented um, Sistine Wall where Thomas Jefferson used to hide his slaves. And because I guess they took that off so it did not represent the Sistine Wall where he used to um, have the slave quarters, but he didn't want people to know that. I mean, those types of things kind of really are blowing my mind. So I think it's good that not only are people of other races getting informed, we're getting informed as well. Uh, let me take this question from Indy, which says, uh, how do you explain to your friends that it's not just enough not to be racist, but they need to be anti-racist? Anybody? How do you explain it? <laughs> primary bedroom, Joseph Powell says. Yeah, they're calling it <laughs> primary bedroom. All right, well, you can think on that if you come up with an answer. Um, <laughs> People need to provide some reading material. People need to read. We have to read. Really, really, really read. We can't just, this will not happen in a day. Right. We have to read and we have to study. And our friends have to read and study. If they're really committed um, to ch turning a new leaf and changing and helping us and helping us to fight systemic racism, they're going to have to study. There's a lot of work that has to be done. Yeah. And is it all on us, though? I mean, do we have to be the one and be like, OK, here I go out. It's my turn to inform people. It's my turn to tell people, you know, I mean, that is such a, a burden. Um, 
Bathtub Jen says, we black people speak about racism so easily among ourselves. I think it needs to happen more with non-blacks right now. They seem to be more open to hearing it. So I guess if you get, you know, a question and then you got to just be ready to answer it. And then I think folks need to do research too. I mean, it's one thing to talk to your black friend. Another thing is read a book. You know, um, there are a lot of books that are out there and have been out there for years, like uh, Dr. Beverly Tatum's book about uh, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? It's the 20th anniversary of the book and not many things have changed since you originally wrote that book. Very, very mm -hmm. good book. White Fragility is a good book for people to read too. Um, can and then you guys, go ahead, Kenya. Uh, um, you know, this is kind of, maybe this is an unpopular opinion. But right. I've been really, I've been really um, happy to see that the protests, I've been able to participate in two, one in Columbia, one in DC. But I think in Atlanta, um, hopefully, you know, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but I think it's approaching maybe close to four weeks or so where it's been consistent protesting. And, you know, you know, I've been hearing also like what you were saying about, isn't it exhausting? Isn't it tiring to have to explain and carrying that weight. Um, I just think like when we think back to like the 60s and, you know, the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. a lot of movements like this lasted beyond that, you know, maybe double or triple the amount of time. And so it's really interesting how this generation, my generation, I'm acting like I'm disconnected from it, but it's really interesting how we're, you know, just this idea of being tired. I understand emotionally is very taxing but to say that you know we're tired you know and subsequently that we're not going to do xyz i just think sometimes like for me personally i'm trying to get to a point where i'm able to maintain a balance mm -hmm. everyone has to achieve a balance it looks different for everybody especially for your mental health um but i think to say that you know we're tired is kind of like I don't feel like I can't be tired. This is just my personal take. I don't feel like I can't be tired when there are so many people before me that did what they did. You know, you know, you have the Little Rock Nine, for example, that made it possible for me to get the education that I've gotten. You know, you have Ruby Bridges, you have so many different, you know, figures. And it's kind of like, I'm sure they were tired, you know what I'm saying, at different times, but had they not pressed forward, would we be in the place that we are now? So I think that it's valid to check in with ourselves emotionally, physically, you know, just making sure that we're not doing something that's going to put us at exhaustion. But I think to say that we're tired, like I'm willing to have that conversation with my white friends. I'm willing to people, you know, you, 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 you figure out very quickly whether someone wants to be, whether someone is listening to hear you or whether someone's listening to respond. So I think we just have to be, to pick our battles um, and, and we'll be good to go. Okay. Thank you, Kenya. Look at that. Inspiring me. All right. Do we have any final thoughts? Uh, I'll start with Adrian. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Um, no, not really. I don't have any. You don't have a final thought. Okay. Uh, Talibo, do you have a final thought that you just want to leave people with about your art or promote anything or tell us what you got going on? Um, final thought, stay persistent. Um, mm -hmm. and also I saw someone in the comments, um, said that we too have a lot of, of learning, studying research to do, to kind of unlearn a lot of things that, that we were taught and to also understand what our history truly is. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's a part of you know, strengthening who we are as a people and strengthening our sense of self. And, you know, if our sense of self is self is strengthened, we will not allow anyone to disrespect that. And so um, I think going within, doing our own research and also, like Kenya said, being um, open and not necessarily, because what she said about the, the ancestors of the people who have come before us is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, we have not even experienced a tenth of what they experienced to get us to the point that we are today. So we need to honor that and honor their work um, and continue the work. 
Okay. Uh, is Kenya still I with? I do have final thoughts, actually. Oh, you do have? Okay. All I right. I don't know. It looked like she. Um, yeah, it looked like she got out of here. fell off. Okay, but, go um, ahead. Yeah. So my final thoughts is um, everybody has a voice, and anybody can protest. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to go outside and protest. You could do it through writing. You could do it through dancing, any form, whatever you, whatever you feel like you you need to do it through whatever, whatever talent you think you have, whatever. Um, occupation you pursue, people that you talk to that could be a protest. So conversations you have, and, um, yeah, that's okay. it. All right, well, Adrian and Woodard, thank you so much. I'm sorry we lost Kenya Cummings. And Taliba Newman, thank you so much for being with me today. And you guys, thank you so much for uh, the audience. Uh, you guys were really involved and really engaged and sending some really good questions. If we couldn't get with uh, to you, I apologize for that. Thanks panel for being here. And I just want to let you guys know that, you know, remember it all starts with a conversation. And even in the midst of chaos, it's important to start the discussion. I'm April Woodard. Thanks for joining us.